Having triumphed against the troops of the praetors Claudius Glauber and Publius Varanius, and with over 70,000 men under his command, Spartacus was ready to take the next steps in his uprising. Contrary to what it may seem, his troops were much more dispersed and less centralized than a conventional army. This resulted in unpredictable actions, to say the least, in some situations. This uncertainty became even more pronounced after the rebellion's main leaders, Spartacus and Crixus, began to fall out. Some historians argue that the primary reasons for this split were the strategic prospects of these two warriors, since Spartacus most likely wished to take his troops to the north of Italian territory, aiming to cross the Alps and head for Thrace or Gaul, demonstrating his wish to end hostilities. But historical records indicate that Crixus disagreed completely with this strategy and wanted to advance against Rome directly while continuing to plunder and loot the valuable regions of southern Italy. This interpretation of events is primarily due to the lists written by the historian and poet Publius Annius Florus, who documented advances made by Spartacus's troops against the regions of Thuri and Metapontum, geographically distant from Nola and Nuceria, where Spartacus's troops were based and recruited. According to Florus, a raid in such distant regions would denote the presence of two factions within the rebel troops. Furthermore, he tells us about an attack by Lucius Gellius, who at one point advanced against troops led by Crixus, comprising just over 30,000 men. Plutarch also mentions a possible rift between the insurgent troops. In some of his writings, he claims that the insurgents were divided into those who wanted to fight their way to freedom and those who wanted to seek wealth and revenge against Rome. Also, some authors argue that one of the main drivers of this rebel split was Onimaus's death, who led the men together with Spartacus and Crixus, but who ended up dying in some of the innumerable battles fought against the Roman troops. Disagreements aside, most men still followed Spartacus's lead. Around the spring of 72 BC, the rebel troops started to move, breaking out of their winter camps and heading north. But the Romans were already weary of the constant looting and vandalism by Spartacus and his men. The Senate gathered to take action against them, seeking to obliterate them all. The consuls Publius Valerius Poplicola and Gnaeus Cornelius Lentulus Clodanius assembled a large number of soldiers and went into battle. As the Romans marched, Spartacus's forces, too large to advance as a single troop, were divided. Crixus led some of the men, and Spartacus the others in a bid to cross the Apennines and allow his followers to return to their homes. Aware of this division of the rebels, the Romans chose to attack both troops separately, with Poplica pushing forward against Crixus's forces and Claudianus charging at the men led by Spartacus. Initially, Poplica was remarkably effective in his advance, killing more than two-thirds of the forces under Crixus's within a brief time, along with Crixus himself, who was defeated near Mount Gargano. Spartacus, meanwhile, was leading the rest of the rebels northwards. Upon reaching the river Po, they avoided a face-off. While his army was numerous, he lacked the same maneuverability as the well-trained Roman soldiers, putting him at a disadvantage. With Consul Lentulus's army to the north and the other Consul Poplica quickly approaching from the south, Spartacus found himself cornered between the two. Against all odds, Spartacus succeeded in defeating first one army and then the other. The way in which Spartacus accomplished this astonishing victory is mysterious, as the Romans, mortified by their loss at the hands of rebellious slaves, kept the details a secret. Following the triumph, Spartacus chose to honor the memory of his former ally Crixus by ordering the sacrifice of 300 Roman prisoners in his memory. In an act of revenge and retaliation against the Romans, he ordered the remaining prisoners to be used for the entertainment of his troops, fighting as gladiators. On this event, the writer Publius Florus wrote that Spartacus's men dragged the Romans to fight each other on the funeral pyres of their fallen officers. In his words, as if they wished to put an end to all their past disgrace for having become, instead of a gladiator, a provider of gladiatorial displays. Spartacus then asked his men to smash up all the wagons and supplies they couldn't use, and resumed his march, now totaling an impressive 120,000-man infantry, 
and an unknown number of cavalry, as increased volunteers joined them each day. It is unknown precisely where they were going, with some authors claiming that their initial goal was to advance against the city of Rome, while others claimed that they wanted to redeploy, awaiting the forthcoming attacks and battles. Shortly after, in early 71 BC, Spartacus's forces started moving further south for unknown reasons. Having seen their actions, Rome once again decided to attack them. Nothing less than two armies were sent to crush Spartacus and his men. But once again, the insurgents utterly defeated them. As the historian Appian put it, the war had been going on for three years and had caused the Romans great concern, despite having initially been ridiculed and dismissed as trivial because it involved gladiators. It was also deeply embarrassing for the powerful Roman Republic, which brought practically all its opponents to their knees, to fail to defeat a pack of slaves and gladiators. Such a situation had to end, quickly. Poplica and Claudianus's leadership had proved weak and ineffective, and they were swiftly dismissed from their prestigious positions in the Roman Senate. But there was a genuine issue. Spartacus had struck fear into the Roman elite. Having defeated so many prestigious warriors, no one wanted to command the troops that would go against him. There was also a widespread lack of confidence among the Romans that the consuls could ultimately defeat Spartacus, who was in his third year of struggle for freedom. The ferocious resistance and consecutive victories of the rebel leader had shattered the Roman people's confidence in their own army and its leaders. The man in charge of stopping Spartacus's rebellion had to have great financial, military, and political skills. Without them, he would never be able to accomplish this difficult deed. That man, however, was found. His name was Marcus Licinius Crassus, a powerful Roman elite personality, the richest man in the entire Republic, and an experienced army commander who served under General Sulla in 82 BC. Crassus set about mobilizing a massive army to put an end to the rebellion once and for all. We'll look at this decisive battle between Crassus and Spartacus in the following video in this series. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to our channel. See you in the next video!